بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ریسپیکٹڈ اسکالرس اسٹیمڈ ایلڈرس ریسپیکٹڈ سسٹرس اینڈ ڈیئر برادرس اٹ از اے گریٹ آن فار می ٹو بی امنگ یو ٹوڈے اینڈ پریزینٹ ٹو یو اے ٹاپک آف ڈائر امپورٹنس فار آر کمیونٹی ہیئر ان امیرکا and the Muslim community around the world. <clears throat> I've been talking about diabetes around the country and overseas as well, but the, today's dialogue amongst <clears throat> friends, the taste of it is really uh, very different. <clears throat> I'm thankful to the management of Bethel Qaim for giving me, me this opportunity to address <clears throat> you on this burning topic. And today I got a message from Vilayat Bhai that this is going to be streamed. So on, a, on an urgent note, I put four of my interns and two staff members to review and uh, re-modify all the slides. I have about 114 slides here. I'll be presenting only about 80 slides, and I'll try to finish it in 40 minutes, and then 20 minutes of Q&A. Ramadan fasting and diabetes. First of all, we'll review what diabetes is, then we'll go over Ramadan, and then we'll connect Ramadan fasting and diabetes. At the end, there's also a review of fasting that happens in other religions such as Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Judaism, and Christianity, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to be going into that detail. In America, there are about 30 million people who are either or who have diabetes, and seven million of these individuals don't even know they have diabetes. One in every three individuals do have diabetes. <clears throat> I can bet that all in our audience would know of a, a first degree relative who has diabetes, or would know a friend, a colleague, a co-worker, a student who does have diabetes. Thank you. We are diagnosing 1 million new cases per year, which means that every 23 seconds, one person in the world is getting diagnosed with diabetes. There are over 2,000 cases diagnosed each day. At this time, the current world population by UN statistics is 6.8 billion. The Muslim population is one quarter of that, 24.1% which amounts to 1.8 billion Muslims in the world. By 2040, per WHO statistics, we'll have 642 million people worldwide with diabetes, of which 148 million are Muslims. And of those 148 million Muslims, 50 million do fast on an annual basis. Just a quick overview of uh, diabetes. <clears throat> Uh, previously, it was thought that diabetes uh, occurs due to one or two basic fundamental pathophysiologic defects, but that's not really the case. Uh, we have found out that there are eight basic fundamental pathophysiologic defects in the human body that leads to diabetes. So, for instance, at the level of the pancreas, <clears throat> which is the largest gland in the human body. There are seven glands in the human body. The largest is pancreas. And there are three different kinds of cells in the pancreas. The beta cells, which release insulin, in type 2 diabetic individuals, and the two major kinds of diabetes, type 1 and type 2, about 85 to 90 percent of all people in the world have type 2 diabetes, and 10 to 15 percent have type 1 diabetes. The highest incidence of type 1 diabetes is in the Scandinavian countries, and uh, the highest incidence in America is in North Dakota and Minnesota, 
uh, because a great number of population in those states in the country have Scandinavian descent. Whereas 85% of those with diabetes have type 2, so what happens is that the beta cells that manufacture insulin either are completely exhausted, that happens in type 1, but in type 2, they're not able to produce enough insulin to uh, counter the sugars. Also, there's another kind of cell in the pancreas called alpha cell, which release glucagon, and the ratio is shifted rather than insulin been uh, taking over, the glucagon takes over in type 2 diabetics, especially in the postprandial state or post-meal situations leading to high sugars. The other effect is at the level of the liver, and a very um, commonly asked question in clinical practices is, how come my sugar in the morning was 200 or 300, I was sleeping all night? Well, true, you were sleeping, but the liver was not, and it was throwing tons of sugar in the system, a phenomenon called hepatic glucose output. Due to gluconeogenesis uh, that happens at the level of the liver, producing glucose and about uh, that um, the sugar production from the liver amounts to about 80% of the sugar we get in the fasting state in the morning and the 20% comes from uh, the gluconeogenesis or increased glucose production at the level of the kidneys. A third impact is at the level of the muscles. <clears throat> about 92% of all type 2 diabetic individuals do have insulin resistance, meaning whatever insulin we have in our system is not capable enough of putting and capturing all the sugar and storing it into the muscles. This happens in 92% of all type 2 diabetic individuals. So the phenomena called insulin resistance uh, is another uh, fundamental pathophysiologic defect. Then there are issues at the level of the intestine and the level of the brain and so on and so forth that lead to type 2 diabetes. Identifying patients at risk. So family history of diabetes, people who are overweight with a BMI of uh, 25 or over, African Americans, Native Americans, or Asian Americans. Here I would like to take a minute of your time to tell you an interesting fact. <clears throat> and the fact is that the highest incidence of type 2 diabetes that happen anywhere in the world happens in a tribe called Pima Indians, which are located in, um, uh, in North Dakota and Arizona side and California side. So the Pima Indians, the incidence of type 2 diabetes, the highest incidence of type 2 diabetes anywhere in the world is found in the Pima Indians, 50%, meaning every other person of the clan has type 2 diabetes. Yet, their same cousins living in South America have one of the lowest incidence of diabetes anywhere in the world. Why? I used to go lecture in the Indian tribes when I was in North Dakota, and every time I went to the Indian uh, states, the first thing that greets you out there is casino. So the Indian population, the native Indian population here is used to casino culture. But in South America, their same cousins coming from the same genetic stock, they work in the field, they carry heavy load on the shoulder, and they walk seven miles back home. So the difference in lifestyle with the same genes can impact you tremendously. Uh, women delivering babies over nine pounds or diagnosed with gestational diabetes mellitus are at high risk to develop diabetes. So if a woman has diabetes during pregnancy, there is a 30% chance that they will either get diabetes at some point in their life or would continue to have diabetes. Hypertension, meaning blood pressure greater than 140 over 90, low HDL and high triglycerides, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome in women, uh, habitual physical inactivity, and previously identified insulin um, impaired fasting glucose are some risk factors that we as physicians should be very careful, or physicians amongst the crowd should be very careful in terms of having these individuals 
getting di uh, screened for diabetes. So there are some uh, risk factors which are modifiable and some are not. So hyperglycemia, hypertension, cholesterol issues, smoking, obesity, and physical inactivity are all modifiable risk factors, whereas you cannot really change your genes or family history. Uh, the glucose targets uh, are to keep the pre-meal sugars 110 or less, um, and the two-hour post-meal sugars up to 140 is uh, generally acceptable. If the sugars start to climb higher than this, then the risk of long-term complications of diabetes is very high. At the moment, uh, the budget to deal with diabetes in the country is in the vicinity, uh, from diabetes, is in the vicinity of about $150 billion. And uh, half of that comes from the indirect cost uh, that uh, happens due to loss of work hours, amputations, uh, patients spending time on dialysis machines, and so on and so forth. There's a slight difference in the criteria. This is more for uh, physician attention. The American Diabetes Association target of hemoglobin A1C, which is a gauge through which we measure the sugar control in the body, is less than 7 but the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists and the International Diabetes Federation uh, recommend a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5 or less. Uh, we want diabetics to have blood pressure less than 130 over 80, LDL cholesterol of less than 100, close to 70 over 80 would be ideal, and A1C of 6.5 or less. Uh, this uh, uh, diagram shows the incidence of long-term microvascular complications. So there are two kinds of vessels in the body, the microvasculature and the macro. As the A1C goes beyond 6.5, the chances of retinopathy increases, which is eye damage. And as it goes beyond 7, the chances of kidney damage. And as it goes beyond 7.5, chances of nerve damage increases. Diabetes stands as number one reason for amputation in the country. Last year we had about 93,000 people whose legs were chopped off due to diabetes. This is eye damage, this showing proliferative retinopathy. Uh, in one of the most outstanding trials in the history of diabetology conducted anywhere in the world called DCCT, Diabetes Control and Complication Trials, when we treated these individuals aggressively you could be nice to your patients, but you should be very aggressive on diabetes. And if you are aggressive on diabetes, you can prevent the long-term complications of diabetes about 86% of the time. And that trial that was conducted in 35 of the most reputable centers in the country, including the Mayo Clinic with whom I had the collaboration with, we were able to reduce the proliferative retinopathy by almost 86%. These are some diagrams showing what happens to the cardiac vasculature when diabetes is uncontrolled, leading to atherosclerosis formation and so on. So coming to those trials, um, in the DCCT, DCCT was conducted from 1985 through 1995, uh, showing that if we manage diabetes aggressively, we can reduce the long-term complications drastically. A similar study was conducted in Japan, enrolling 200 patients, and a third one in UK that enrolled almost 5,000 type 2 diabetic individuals, coming out with the same message around the world, that you need to treat diabetes quite aggressively. This diagram is showing that 50% of diabetics in the country, in US, and US claims to have the best healthcare system and the best everything, but 50% of patients in America are undertreated and not appropriately treated in terms of the diabetes management or cholesterol or blood pressure management. Now, I tell my interns, <clears throat> and four or five of them actually work today to re-modify some of these slides. I want it to be a little more complete, uh, thanks to the courtesy of Vilayat Bhai, because it's getting live streamed. So, uh, I tell my interns that you have to fight for every single percent drop in A1C because let's say if you get somebody with a hemoglobin A1C of 12, which means that the diabetes is totally out of control, 
And if you reduce their A1C by 1%, let's say you start the patient on diabetic medications or insulin or whatever, and the patient himself is doing good in terms of diet and exercise, and the A1C reduced from 12 to 11 or 11 to 10, 1% 1 reduction in A1C leads to a 37% reduction in the chances of long-term complications of diabetes. There are some studies, one of the most outstanding study conducted at NIH called DPP, uh, Diabetes Prevention Program, enrolled the first degree relatives of people with diabetes who did not initially have diabetes. And we divided them into five groups. Uh, one group was treated with metformin, another with sulfonylurea, and a third with uh, glitazones. But the group that showed the most outstanding result was the one with lifestyle modification, meaning if you improve your diet and exercise, you reduce the chances of long-term complications even if you are the first degree relative of a diabetic individual by almost 65%. Similar studies were conducted elsewhere in the world. Prevention of type 2 diabetes, so uh, even if you lose 5 to 7% of weight, it matters, it matters quite a lot. And the physical activity, a moderate exercise, 150 to 210 minutes per week is recommended. 74% and 86% achieved this in the diabetes prevention program. Now look at Ramadan fasting and diabetes. <clears throat> uh, Islam is the last, uh, <clears throat> and pardon me, there might be some slides which are more integrated to society as I had to, um, the occasion to deliver some of these lectures in the non-Shia mosques as well. Uh, Islam is the last divine religion uh, brought by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Muslims from Indonesia to Morocco and in Europe and North America, they all fast. The pillars of faith are Salat, Psalm, Hajj, Zakat, Khums, Jihad, uh, Ramadan is the ninth lunar month. It may fall in any season. It falls 11 days early on the gartering calendar. Muslim countries, average daytime uh, fasting uh, um, is 12 to 14 hours, although at this time in America, the fast is 17 and a half to 18 hours. Uh, polar regions such as Alaska, Norway, Iceland, etc., they have about 20 to 21 hours of fasting. Uh, the fasting period is dawn to sunset. Fasting is obligatory on all healthy Muslims, adults, uh, men and women. During the period of fasting, one should abstain from all foods, fluids, tobacco, and oral inhalers and nutrients. Sexual intercourse also from dawn to dust. Quran and the Islamic theological perspectives. Uh, these three ayats are from Surah Baqarah, chapter 2. O you who believe fasting has been prescribed to you. So the choice of word is so immaculate, prescribed. Prescribed means it's a prescription. Fasting is a prescription sent from God to you as it was prescribed to those before you as that you attained taqwa. Uh, this is ayat number 183 of Surah Baqarah. Uh, another ayat, if you fast, it is better for you if you only knew. And the third one, God intends every facility for you he does not want to put you into difficulties. These are three continuous I. Those not required to fast, acutely ill, pregnant, menstruating, lactating, frail and elderly, insane, travelers, and these individuals are either not required to fast or fast for missed days later after these conditions are, are resolved. Uh, this is a physician-specific slide. So conditions related to diabetes, which, on the basis of which we uh, advise our patients not to fast, are advanced nephropathy or kidney damage, 
severe retinopathy or eye damage, autonomic neuropathy. Uh, there are kinds of nerves in the human body that supply all our rich organs such as heart and uh, stomach and sexual organs and whatnot. So uh, the neuropathy of those, that kind of neuropathy can lead to uh, uh, a number of problems. So uh, people with diabetes with that kind of neuropathy are also uh, usually advised not to fast. Hypoglycemic unawareness. This is a condition not uncommon. And what it is is that although the usual sugar is between 70 to 110 or 120, but there are individuals in whom the sugar would be, let's say, 50. If you would have a sugar level of 50, that is hypoglycemia, and you would feel irritable, confused, sweaty, you may have heart palpitations, you feel very weak, lethargic, and if the sugar drops further, you may enter into a coma, and you may have seizure. But there are diabetic individuals in whom uh, these autonomic nerves are affected, and even if they would have sugar of 50 or 40 or 30, they would have no perception of it. And this is a very dangerous situation because they can go into coma like that. So that in that situation, we usually do not recommend fasting. Major microvascular diseases, as we reviewed already, recent hyperosmolar state uh, or diabetes ketoacidosis, these are diabetic emergencies which are treated in intensive care units in the hospitals. Poorly controlled diabetes, meaning random glucose over 300, and multiple insulin injections per day uh, in type 1 diabetics, these individuals should usually not be fasting. There are two physiological conditions, pregnancy and lactation, which prevent one from fasting. Now, there are some coexisting conditions which also um, should be considered and they be advised against fasting, which are acute pep peptic ulcer disease, severe pulmonary tuberculosis, severe, um, um, bronchial asthma, recurrent stone formation, uh, cancers with poor general condition, overt cardiovascular disease, recent uh, heart attacks, um, psychotic conditions, and hepatic dysfunctions with elevated transaminases. The purpose of fasting, uh, the classic Islamic uh, point of view, and those who are not healthy are exempt from fasting, if fasting places the patient's health at risk. As more diabetic patients insist on fasting, it has become increasingly important for medical professionals and diabetic patients to be aware of the potential risks and address their approaches to mitigate these risks. So. I am seeing a number of physicians in the audience. I must uh, convey this message to our brothers and sisters in profession that it has become incumbent upon us to teach our fellow physicians not belonging to the Islamic faith uh, in terms of Ramadan fasting and diabetes. One reason that I'm actually uh, conducting these lectures in multiple centers this year is, number one, the uh, gravity of the situation is enormous, but on the other, our brethren in profession do not really know how to deal with Muslim patients come Ramadan. And a lot of these physicians are actually uh, telling patients uh, whatever they feel like. So, the American Diabetes Association, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, the Joslin Diabetes Center, the Emory, the Cleveland Clinic, and the International Diabetes Federation and the British Medical Association, they've all come out with guidelines. Uh, all the leading experts in diabetes, Muslim experts in diabetes from around the world gathered together from 13 different countries and formed a consortium that actually edu educated the International Diabetes Federation, and the recent guidelines have come out, which I'm going to discuss in a little while. Uh, it is also important because in the last uh, 10 years, there are so many medications that have come out for the treatment of diabetes that we never had those before uh, in centuries. So it is very, very important to know in greater depth, and our Muslim patients should be encouraged 
when they go to their physicians who are not from the community to be asking appropriate questions. International conferences in Iran and um, other places, other Muslim countries have already happened on this subject. And inshallah, one day I plan to hold an international conference on this subject in America also. These are the various schools of thoughts, the Hanafi, Shafi, Maliki, Hanbali, Jafari, um, Wahhabi, Salafi, Bori, Ismaili. So oral medications, insulin and glucose mon uh, monitoring. Oral medications are not allowed in any of the mazhab. Insulin, it is usually allowed, the subcutaneous injection of insulin, or individuals who are on insulin pump, which is a very novel way of treating diabetes. So it is generally allowed. Uh, glucose monitoring uh, has also been allowed. Now, a lot of time the patients would ask us, am I allowed to check sugars during the daytime when I'm fasting? Am I allowed to take insulin? So my personal um, ask from these patients is that uh, you ask your imam. If your imam allows it, fine. But many a time what has happened is that these imams have said to the patients, uh, to these individuals, go ask your doctor. If your doctor allows it, uh, it's permissible. So <clears throat> the, uh, the decree on that, although it's not uniform, but the overwhelming uh, consensus is that it is now allowed. There's still some debate on it. Uh, all three of them, the injections, the sub-Q injections, as well as the monitoring. Yeah. Epidemiology of diabetes and fasting. <clears throat> so this is, uh, this is probably one of the most outstanding study conducted uh, in 13 countries, Algeria, Bangladesh, Egypt, India, Indonesia, Jordan, Lebanon, Malaysia, Morocco, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Tunisia, and Turkey meaning all of these presidents were present in Riyadh a little while ago. So, but this was done by the academics. So it was a large epidemiological study, the best ever, with diabetes in 13 Muslim countries enrolling about 13,000 patients. Uh, it is called EPDR study. It showed that 43% of patients with type 1 diabetes and 79% of those with type 2 diabetes in the Muslim countries do fast during Ramadan. Now, what happens in the body from the fed state to the fasting state? The transition from a fed to a fasting state can be divided into these three stages. The post-absorptive stage lasts six to 24 hours uh, after, being, uh, after beginning fasting. The gluconeogenic phase lasts from two to 10 days of fasting, and the protein conservation phase beyond 10 days of fasting. I'll explain to you further in, uh, in the, these slides. Uh, so glucose changes in diabetics uh, during fasting. In the first some days of fasting, there's a slight decrease seen in the glucose in the body. By 20th day of fasting, the glucose normalizes, and by 29th day of fasting, a slight increment in the uh, serum glucose is seen. The hemoglobin A1c, there's no real change or slight improvement in the gauge through which we measure diabetes. Uh, there are only two studies so far showing that the A1C increases, which means that the diabetes control gets worse, and this happens mainly in people who consume high-calorie diet. After fasting, after a month of Ramadan fasting, the A1C returns to the normal. What happens to the body weight? 50% uh, of the individuals maintain body weight, uh, 20 to 25% lose weight, and 25% gain weight. It all depends as to what you are really eating. Are you fasting and feasting? But those who lose weight, uh, 3.75 to 6.17 pound weight loss has been seen in those who eat in moderation. 
Insulin level decreases, growth hormone increases, adrenaline increases. Uh, total cholesterol, the bad and the good cholesterol, uh, the bad cholesterol and the triglycerides, they all decrease. Uh, the urine output decreases. There's no change in sodium, potassium, calcium um, during fasting. Now, risk stratification, and this is probably the most important aspect of this presentation. Many patients with diabetes insist on fasting during Ramadan, thereby creating a medical challenge for themselves and their health care providers. So the bulk of literature indicates that fasting in Ramadan is safe for the majority of type 2 diabetic individuals with proper education and diabetic management. So we divide these uh, diabetics into three categories. Very high-risk patients, moderately uh, uh, risky patients, and patients who are fine. So very high-risk patients, if somebody has severe low sugars within three months prior to Ramadan, diabetic ketoacidosis within three months prior to Ramadan, which is diabetic emergency, or uh, other diabetic-related comas, or history of recurrent low sugars and poorly controlled type 1 diabetics, they are very high-risk individuals. Pregnancy in the pre-existing diabetic or gestational diabetes, patients on dialysis machines or chronic kidney disease, and advanced complications or old age with ill health or acute illnesses, they are very high-risk patients and they are advised not to fast. Then the high-risk category. Patients having one or more of the following characteristics, such as type 2 diabetes with um, sustained poor sugar control, uh, and if they're type 1, even with good control, well-controlled type 2s on multiple um, insulin injections, uh, pregnant um, women, uh, and uh, uh, individuals with third-degree kidney failure are high risk. Stable macrovascular complications, meaning if somebody has coronary artery disease, let's say, or stroke, but they're stable, patients with comorbid conditions uh, that present uh, additional risk factors, such as if somebody is morbidly obese um, or has high cholesterol, uh, people with diabetes performing intense physical labor, and treatment with drugs that may affect the cognitive function because as you know, the only fuel that the brain uses is sugar. So there are certain drugs that uh, can impair cognition and uh, can impair the glucose utilization by the brain, so these individuals cannot fast. So what to do for category one and two patients? If patient insists on fasting, then they should receive the structured education. And it is recommended that these individuals should see the diabetologist at least three months in advance. Uh, we do get uh, tons of phone call a uh, day before or some days before Ramadan asking if they can fast or not. But actually, the process should start much in advance. Be followed by a qualified diabetes team. Check their blood sugars regularly. Uh, they are now. Uh, devices available which can check your sugar continuously throughout the day. The, uh, these devices can check up to 300 times a day without you pricking the finger 300 times. Be prepared to break the fast in case of hypo or hyperglycemia. So it is generally agreed upon amongst the experts in diabetes that if the sugar starts to go less than 70 milligram per deciliter, a person should break the fast. Be pre prepared to stop the fast in cases of frequent low sugars or worsening of other related medical conditions. Those with moderate or low risk, these are well-controlled type 2 diabetics with one or more of the following lifestyle therapies. They can be given either metformin, acarbose, thiazolidines, second-generation sulfonylureas, incretin-based therapies, and insulin. Patients who fast should receive structured education, check their blood sugars regularly, and adjust the medications as per recommendations. The key components are, well, we have discussed this, so I'll omit this. This is, uh, you know, they should be checking the sugars throughout 24 hours, multiple times. So these are the guidelines for physicians and patients. And remember the three Ds. 
diet control, daily activity, and drug regimen, which should be individualized. So this is mainly of physician interest, and I'll skip this, but this is primarily showing that we need to strategize and do the risk stratification and then allow or disallow a patient. So diet management. <clears throat> Let me actually uh, tell you that uh, <clears throat> the diet should not differ too much from one's normal everyday recommended diet. Enhanced nutritional awareness through dietary counseling is important. Food containing complex carbohydrates have low glycemic index are given at the uh, pre-dawn meal because of the delay in digestion and absorption. The complex carbohydrates are found in grains and seeds like barley, wheat, oats, millets, beans, lentils, etc. Food containing simple carbohydrates are given at sunset uh, meal because of quick absorption. Simple carbs are found in fruits, vegetables, and milk. Discourage the patients from eating high glycemic index foods like more than three dates because the glycemic index of one date is 42, which is a moderate. So if you eat two uh, dates, uh, the calorie count could go up to, depending upon what kind of date you are eating, between three to 800 until about half an hour after taking drugs to minimize the sharp rise in glucose. Uh, increase intake of fiber, that's whole grain, fruits, and vegetable um, is good. It lasts up to eight hours. Decrease intake of refined food lasts up to three to four hours only. Recommended daily fluid intake is 1.5 liters a day. A man or a woman loses about 2.5 liters of water from the body on uh, any given day, of which 1.5 liters is lost in the urine, and the rest is lost in perspiration, respiration, menstruation, lactation, etc. So you should at least be uh, um, taking what you're losing. Overweight people should not gain weight, uh, should spread the total caloric intake over one small meal, uh, but uh, as you see in our iftars around the world, what happens, a lot of purging happens. Diet containing 2,200 kilocalorie a day is recommended, uh, and it should be balanced, 30% proteins, 40% carbs, and 30% fat. This is the usual pyramid. I, I hope many of you would know. Uh, the grains, beans, and starchy vegetables uh, should be the bulk at the bottom then uh, vegetable three to five servings and fruits, and then milk two to three servings, and so on. So here's a comparison of the foods to avoid and food you should eat. So deep fried foods like pakoras, samosas, and fried dumpling should be avoided. You can have whole grain like uh, chickpeas, samosas baked instead of fried. High-fat cooked foods like parathas um, should be avoided. Chapatis made without oil, baked or grilled meat and chicken are fine. High-sugar and high-fat food like gulab jamun and rasgulla can be replaced with milk-based sweets and puddings like rasmalai. <laughs> the cooking method to avoid the frying, defrying, and curries with excessive oil, that kind of method should be Many a times when uh, male patients come to us with their spouses with uncontrolled sugars, it is actually uh, what's happening is that the wives are cooking too good. <laughs> so alternative cooking methods, grilling or baking, should be used. These are some very quick 14 slides. Uh, the chaka hookah from Algeria these are the iftar foods from many different Muslim countries which are good. Food from Iran, uh, kebabs are served with either rice or white bread. Stuffed grape leaves from Egypt. Dahi bare from India. <laughs> Haleem from Pakistan. <laughs> no, Nihari is not included, I'm sorry. <laughs> Food from Iraq. You know that. <laughs> Adas from Palestine. Yeah. Arroz Caldo from Philippines. 
is a rice soup with chicken as the usual protein in it. Beef render, um, rendang from Indonesia. What started as a way of uh, preserving meat in the Minang Kabu culture. Haris from United Arab Emirates. Chicken and rice soup from Morocco. Barik from Turkey. The fillings are generally savory, ranging from cheese to ground beef or spinach. Batata hara from Lebanon. These are spiced potatoes, make a flavorful appetizer and side dish. Well, so <clears throat> diet is very, very important. Um, many of the foods that are encouraged to eat are also mentioned in the Holy Quran and the Sunnah. The most commonly consumed foods by Prophet Muhammad um, during Ramadan were milk, dates, lamb, mutton, and oats. It's also the Hadith of Prophet that we do not eat full. We keep um, one-third for food, one-third for water, and one-third for air. So these are the calorie counts of roti and paratha on the left and pizza on the right. So calories in the roti and paratha are 212 compared to pizza 272 uh, with 2 gram protein and compared to 12.3 gram on pizza and carbs 26 versus 33 and so on. Chinese food, uh, calories 363, Nihari 300, and fried chicken breast 423. So you can compare and have your choice. <laughs> now, these are some commonly used uh, foods with glycemic index. What is glycemic index? Glycemic index is a number associated with a particular type of food that indicates the food's effect on a person's blood sugar level. So dates, as I said, the glycemic index of date is 42, white rice 70, brown rice 50, and chapati 100, and uh, pakora 70, and french fries 95, and Coca-Cola 63, and so on. Now exercise. <clears throat> Fasting does not interfere with tolerance to exercise. Light to moderate exercise must be continued, brisk walking for 30 minutes every day, preferably two hours after the uh, sunset meal, or maybe an hour prior to iftari is fine. From pharmacological management, uh, <clears throat> which I'm going to actually summarize just in very quickly, Overwhelmingly, metformin, A-carbos, uh, glitazones, DPP-4 inhibitors are fine to be used uh, during fasting without much of a dose change. The dose change is required for sulfonylureas. If somebody is on glimepiride or gliburide or amaryl, uh, these agents should be reduced by at least 50% in the morning, but the full dose can be taken in the evening. And those individuals who are on insulin the long-acting insulins can be reduced by 20%, and the short-acting insulins should not be used during the fasting time. The dose should be reduced by 40 to 60% in the morning, but the full dose can be taken in the evening. That is the nutshell, which is depicted here. Um, this, I think we have discussed all this, so in the interest of time, I'm just going to so <clears throat> there are four major risk factors when a diabetic individual is fasting hyperglycemia hypoglycemia dehydration and thrombosis uh, a report from Saudi Arabia suggested an increased risk of an increased incidence of retinal vein occlusion in patients who fasted there are some studies conducted there However, hospitalization due to coronary events or strokes were not seen to be increased during uh, Ramadan in the hospitals. Diabetic ketoacidosis. So these are some risk factors. Um, conclusion. Majority of the uncomplicated type 2 diabetic patients can fast during Ramadan. Pre-Ramadan medical assessment, education, and motivation are very important to prevent diabetic-related complications. 
Islam allows diabetics to have regular food, uh, blood tests while fasting. Uh, fasting along with regular prayer have been uh, proved to aid in better control of diabetes. Because what happens uh, with prayers, and there are studies conducted in multiple universities in the West and the East um, of the medical benefit of prayers, one very outstanding study done at McGill's shows that when a person fasts, a uh, person prays, um, all the relaxing hormones come into existence and the stressful hormones are uh, suppressed, which is very beneficial. It's anti-aging. It improves the synaptic connections, improves the focus, improves the longevity, improves the vasculature, improves the sugars, improves the heart, improves the vessels, and so on. Individualization and frequent monitoring of glycemic um, glycemia uh, is very important. So I won't go into fasting in different religions, but I want to thank all the contributors who made this presentation possible. With that, I thank you all very much for your time. I know how difficult it was on a busy Friday and spending one more hour here in and the mosque. Thank you for coming and at your service, thank you. It's a great pleasure, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, just question about the retinas. Is that when you get the eye retinas? Yes. Is that, uh, I'm sorry, maybe my accent is not... Uh, no problem. Uh, I mean, when you get damage for yeah. the retinas, is that can be uh, fixed, or it should be implanted, or... So uh, the question is, if the retina gets damaged, could it be fixed? <clears throat> so let me uh, say that an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. So our emphasis is that it, it, we shouldn't come to a point that the retina gets damaged. And how can we prevent the damage? If we control the sugars real well, if we control the blood pressure real well, and if we control the cholesterol real well, by diet, exercise, and therapeutic intervention, the retina can stay healthy forever. However, when that doesn't happen and the retinas are damaged, then there are therapies available, uh, especially laser therapies are available to improve that damage. Uh, it can be improved to a good extent, but cannot be totally reversed. Good question. Well, um, you mentioned a lot about increased, um, especially when I would say compromised liver function, you mentioned increased hepatic glucose production. Is fatty liver symptomatic of diabetes or can it be exacerbated by diabetes? Yeah, it's a very good question. Actually, fatty liver is not exacerbated by, mm, by fasting. Uh, what is fatty liver? Fatty liver is the abnormal accumulation of fat in the liver. And uh, when that fat starts getting accumulated in the liver, it can lead to a lot of problem. If it becomes chronic and advancing, it can lead to cirrhosis of the liver. It can damage the liver drastically. But a lot of fatty liver uh, is not that serious, and it is usually mild. So. The way to prevent that is to, you know, to avoid all the greasy, cheesy, yummy stuff. The Pizza Hut, Burger King, McDonald, Kentucky Fried, Boston Chicken, Wendy's, Papa John's, Brothers, we need to avoid all that. And the equivalents are the Shirmal and the Taftan and Parathas and so on. So if we control our diet well, then that abnormal accumulation can be prevented to some extent. So fasting actually is beneficial. Diabetes, what happens in diabetes? The commonest lipid abnormality in diabetes is hypertriglyceridemia and low HDL. High triglycerides, all these things that I mentioned, Pizza Hut, Burger King, and Paratas, they are high in triglycerides. And these triglycerides get accumulated in the liver leading to damage. So excess sugar in the system also gets converted into triglycerides then get deposited there. So again, prevention of all this is in our hand to a good extent by diet and exercise. So then um, I'm hearing you say that you can control diabetes, that that would help perhaps reverse some of the symptoms of fatty liver? 
you know, total reversement is not entirely possible, but it can be reduced to a good extent because some of it is actually genetic. Go ahead. Okay. So you mentioned hyperlipidemia. Um, is it always present with diabetes? Not always. It is present to a fairly good extent, especially if diabetes is uncontrolled. The excess sugar gets converted into triglycerides, and um, it is the commonest lipid abnormality. It's the commonest uh, cholesterol abnormality that happens in people with diabetes. So the recommendation is to keep the triglycerides 150 or less in people with diabetes. But when it starts to increase and go over 250 or 300, then um, the chances of accumulation in the liver are quite high. Um, the highest uh, triglyceride that I have seen ever in the last 30 years was in Casino Cook, 55-year-old Casino Cook, coming in with triglyceride level of 80,000, with all heart arteries blocked completely, and the liver was full of cholesterol. So the cardiothoracic surgeon actually called me and said, you know, he came in with a heart attack and wanted to operate, do the uh, open heart surgery, and said, uh, you know, what can we do? Because if he would open this kind of a patient up, he cannot locate the arteries, everything will be milk. The entire blood would be milky and he won't be able to locate the heart arteries. So what can we do? So, um, I said, if you give me five days, you can go ahead and operate. And these individuals, the, the treatment of choice for these individuals is to put them in uh, intensive care units and start them on insulin. Insulin has the capability and capacity to take away all, all the food from the body and uh, metabolize it. So within five days, his triglycerides going to reduce from 80,000 down to 500 and he got operated upon successfully. Um, but uh, um, we should be very, very careful. Triglycerides over um, 150 in diabetics is not acceptable. based on meta-analysis. Uh, and those studies are still not available. for bringing this question and I apologize and my uncle actually emailed me yesterday and I had to talk on the SGLT2 inhibitors also. Thank you very much for the article in that uncle. Uh, <clears throat> SGLT2 inhibitors as you know are the latest uh, drugs approved for diabetes about two and a half years ago. There are three of them available in the market at this time in Vokana, Jardians and Farsiga. Uh, these are fascinating drugs and their impact is primarily at the level of the kidneys. Uh, what happens is that all the excess sugar goes through the kidneys and 
and in the normal person, the kidneys reabsorb all that sugar and put it, uh, you know, restore it and put it back into the body. These SGLT2 uh, receptor blockers they prevent the receptors and let all the excess sugar go in the stream. So people lose a lot of sugar in the urine. That also leads to weight loss. And uh, these are usually non-hypoglycemic agents, meaning if the sugars are high, they would normalize, but they would not lower the normal sugars. Yes, if uh, these individuals are also on insulin or sulfonylureas, we need to curtail those doses down because the hypoglycemia would be on account of those drugs. Generally, the recommendation by all experts for Ramadan fasting is that these agents can be continued. What you may want to do in some people is that you can change the timing to evening time rather than in the morning. They usually want the day drugs. Um, does it uh, answer your question completely or? Oh, yes. Yes, yes. So again, a very delicate question and very important question from the physician perspective that Dr. Zaidi is asking. Uh, diabetes ketoacidosis has been reported in actually even in type 2 diabetic individuals who were treated with these agents. So usually what has been seen in post-marketing research is that those who got uh, DKA um, were either dehydrated or infected who had some risk factor leading to uh, hyperglycemia. So these patients may or may not have the classic symptoms of DKA. What are the classic symptoms? Classic symptoms are polyuria, polytipsia, you know, lethargy, uh, abdominal pain and all that. A lot of times they may not exactly present that way but they may have just some lethargy. They would usually have sugars over 300 despite the fact that they are on standard of care therapy. Uh, and there could be some signs of infection or dehydration. They could also be on uh, diuretics that would be an additional factor in leading to this. But the presentation may not be very clear cut. This is absolutely right. So, um, Sister, uh, I have to um, actually <coughs> differ uh, uh, quite a bit on this. Metformin is the most used anti-diabetic medication in the world. And it is dirt cheap and it is very effective. So, both on account of its cost and its impact on diabetes, it is one of the most outstanding and the most studied drug in the history of drugs in the world. It is very commonly used in people diabetes and um, about 20% of people on metformin can lose up to 20 pounds. So it does not lead to weight gain. It can lead to up to 20 pound weight loss. Yes. Yes, yes. I know the pharmaceutical industry would be asking this question. So, yes, about 20% of people on metformin would have GM side effects and diarrhea or upset stomach or queasy stomach, you know, are some of the side effects that happen in about 20% of those taking metformin. Uh, usually it's short-lived. Uh, it would go away within weeks. But if that doesn't happen and somebody continue to have diarrhea, then you should not be using it. Thank you. So if there are no further questions. So we'll